Hi everyone, it's Jerry. Let's have a look at another game between Alpha Zero, playing on the white end, and Stockfish. So we have another French defense. Two of the ten games uh, are with this opening, Alpha Zero playing white in both cases. In fact, same variation, Steinitz with move four, e5. And we have this same position again in the other French defense game, black captured on d4 at the first available moment. Not here. Knight c6 instead. Some attention on d4. And after bishop d3, we have c4. Okay, more common are the moves b5, some grabbing some queenside space or queen to b6, exerting more pressure on white center, but c4 in the game follows. With a punch, the bishop drops back, but notice now that white does not have to tend to the d4 square as much. There's no longer as much pressure on it, and because he is still present, the d4 pawn, he takes away a very important square from two of black's minor pieces. Black continues to press with b5, looking for b4. White puts a halt to that with a3. This can only be this move b4 can only be prevented for so long, but it's certainly worthwhile to invest the move a3 for two reasons. One, White is saying with the move a3, if you are to play b4, you will have to first help my rook. I will capture, my rook will be activated. And two, in order for you to play b4, you will now have to invest two tempi before you are in position to play it, namely rook b8 and a5. Continuing, rook b8, castles, castles. Right around this stage, I questioned, would it have been better for black to prevent white's next move, f5? Okay, this is the move that was played in the game, f5. With this advance, many many white pieces are brought to life. The bishop, the rook. You can't capture because you would lose an important center pawn. Should this move have been prevented? Could it have been prevented? I like to take one step back. Instead of castles, can black play g6, in other words, clamping down on this advance? The answer to that is no, because g4 is in, f5 gets pushed through still, and white is for choice. You can't stop f5 with g6. In the game, it was castles. F5, black gets on with the B4 advance, or B4 prep. F takes E, F takes E. Instructional moment in the game. I must have cycled through this one at least a dozen times, and this was an instructive moment for me. The top choice by Stockfish is to play A4, and another top choice is Queen to E1 here. Alpha Zero doesn't play either of those moves. Instead, it's bishop to d1. In fact, uh, with the line queen to e1, Stockfish was prepared to meet b4 with a capture, and then dropping the knight back to d1. But the knight from d1, what is his future? f2? No. What is he doing from f2? e3? While that's on one of the key 16 squares on the board, what is his future from e3? He would be negated by the pawn on e6. The idea here with bishop d1 is to play after b4 chop chop knight e2. This is the move in the game. What is his future? It's to go into f4. Okay, from f4 you can be sure his presence is felt. He's putting pressure on the weakest square in black's camp, e6. That's the base point of black's pawn chain, and this is the point that will require the defense of one of the black pieces. c3 follows in the game, move 17. This is a pawn sacrifice, by the way, this c3 advance. White is working still with this space advantage since move 4, and black is giving white a pawn now in order to mobilize the king knight. Okay, he's going to now have 
the C4 square to work with. Okay, if C4, excuse me, C3 is not played right now, the King Knight, his mobility, at minimum, the King Knight's mobility is diminished. Some other pieces may be influenced as well, but it's certainly the King Knight who will struggle to find some uh, active role in the position. Uh, so, for example, if knight b6 is played in this position, queen e1, and how do you activate the knight? c3 can now be met with b3, and b3 can be met with c3. In both cases, at minimum, the knight on b6 is really a, you know, he's not doing anything. Therefore, black goes forward with this pawn sacrifice. c3 will ensure that the knight get some active play. Soon it's going to be the best piece for black. B takes C, knight B6. So how to parry the knight move into C4? Well, queen to E1, knight C4, and the bishop drops back to C1. Is this an inconvenience for white? Not really. The bishop, it's true, is now back on his home square, but he's perfectly satisfied negating the knight and doing some more. And he's seeing some other squares and negating the knight. Black's best piece. B takes C follows. Queen takes. Queen B6 is throwing a punch. This pawn is now pinned. So knight takes E5 is a threat. White gets out of the pin. Knight B2. Another instructive moment in the game. Right around this point I questioned good bishops, bad bishops. For white, which one is good, which one is bad? This is white's bad bishop, this is white's good bishop on d1. We see this by the central structure. We can determine this. Alpha zero gives up the good bishop in this case. Right around this point, I thought, well, how do you stop the knight from taking out the good bishop? Well, we just give up our bad bishop for the knight. But we don't have that. So I questioned why. Well, let's see. Knight f4 is the move in the game, and once this move was played, I understood. The bad bishop has a very important role to support a knight f4 move. Okay, if the bishop, if the bad bishop in this case is not around, what will the knight on e2 be doing? What will his future be? So it has to do... Uh, keeping the bad bishop around has to do with ensuring that the knight is activated. Knight takes the bishop on d1. The good bishop is now gone. Bishop d7. h4. Slow, steady progress follows for white on the king side. This is acting as not only a flight square, but white is looking for more space with h5. And one idea for this, uh, or one idea behind this, is to maybe control some light squares. Setting up an h5 and g4 structure would combat this potential idea for black to activate the bad bishop. Continuing, rook a8, bishop d2, connecting rooks. I wondered about one of these two squares, which one is better? The bishop on d2, as we will soon see, will provide some nice support to uh, the base of white's pawn structure, c3, d4, e5. So rook on f to b8. White continues to press on the king side. One rook is off. Queens are now off. And c3. So notice the harmony in white's position. Everything is defended except for the rook. King defends the pawn. Pawn defends the knight. Everything is glued together, one way or the other. And so where is white vulnerable? I don't see it. White still maintains a space advantage, has an extra pawn, and because of this space advantage, this pawn on e5, normally a space advantage is... Uh, seen or, or, or felt um, in the middle game, but here too, in the end game, this space advantage is felt. This is allowing the white king to uh, 
activate more easily. Okay, if we look at the e5 pawn, he's taking away the d6 square. The king, the black king, of course, can never make use of e6. The pawn is also taking out the f6 square. So we have this little wall that's based, basically shielding off the black king. Where will he get activated? Okay, his future, difficult to determine, you know, what his career is going to be in this endgame. Rook b3. We have a little back and forth with the rooks on the a and b files for a little bit. White wants to keep the rook on. Why exactly? Well, this is another instructive moment in the game. After g4, multiple offers of a rook exchange. White does not want that. What we're going to find is by keeping a rook on board, eventually white is going to bring it to a point where uh, white can coordinate the rook with a knight. Uh, and with this coordination, there is a uh, a type of synergy between these two pos these two pieces, and that weighs into this end game. Uh, white will be able to coordinate the rook really well with the knight, whereas black will not be able to coordinate their rook with this dead piece on d7. Let's see how we get to that point. King f7, king king g2, bishop c8. This bishop is a terrible piece. His future so far has been to go back and forth on these two squares. That's the bad bishop in the French defense. Rook b6, rook a6, king e8. White is making progress with the king for sure. King g2, king g3, where is he headed? Let's see, knight g6 follows. Rook a3. I didn't point this out yet, but the knight uh, if there's any idea for the knight to drop into c4, which is the weakest square in white's camp still, just like the king knight eventually made use of uh, c4, if this knight tries to make use of c4, that would give up the b8 square, and this rook would be able to uh, cause some problems to the king and to the bishop. So it's important he stays around to control b8. Rook b6, bishop d7. G5, pawn takes pawn. This bishop on d2 at the moment is overloaded. He has to defend, uh, the bishop has to defend c3, and, you know, if you go forward with a capture here with the knight first, that would allow bishop takes bishop, and soon thereafter the rook can grab on c3. So, in the game, we have king g4. So now the pawn is hit three times, defended only once. He's going nowhere. This is uh, instructive when you have a situation like this where you could take a pawn and, you know, he's attacked twice, defended once. Suppose you just add a third attacker, you know, not capture it right away. That's what we have going on here. Simply a third attacker is attacking here. Maybe one day it's the king who wants to be recapturing on the g5 square, and his destination can be to scoop up the g7 pawn. As we're going to see, as this simplifies a little bit more, this endgame, the g7 pawn is where white wants to get to, one way or the other. Maybe with the king, maybe with the rook. Continuing, bishop d8, rook b2, knight takes g5, rook a2, is trying to get into g1. The knight now drops back to f3. He didn't make, this knight didn't make very many moves. Very early on, there was a knight to f3 move. About 40 moves later, he picks up a pawn, and now he's going right back to that f3 square to secure the king post from rook g1. Rook a3, bishop to e2 is clearing the way for the rook. Bishop a5, rook f2. So now, if black follows through with the capture on c3, maintaining, or uh, restoring, let's say, the material, the cost is seen uh, by this rook getting brought to life. It's now coordinated well with the knight on g6. Black has to be very careful. So, for example, if black tries to win the pawn back with bishop takes c3 here, 
what's going to happen is that the knight gets out of the way, there's going to be a check, another check, this pawn is picked up, and you wouldn't believe how fast that h-pawn can run. So black doesn't go in for this. Rook a1 instead. White gets out of the line of fire. Bishop d2. Bishop d8. Rook h2. There's a threat here of h6 activating the rook and getting at the king. There's a lot of pieces that the rook and the knight can be influencing. If the rook is on the seventh rank, the knight. White is able to coordinate very well with the uh, white is able to coordinate very well with the rook and knight in this endgame. So, anticipating this, we have knight e7, trying to get rid of that knight. Bishop g5. Dark square bishops are gone. Black is still left with this terrible bishop. Rook b2, staying very active. This is black's best piece, so it's challenged. He's gone, so what we have here is a very good knight versus a terrible bishop, who again, his future has only been to bounce back and forth, c8, d7, all game. Bishop d7 is the move. Move 54, bishop d7. If the rook takes the pawn, we're going to have the rook sweeping in. This pawn will be tracked down, and that pawn's going to bolt. So, as an example, chop. Rook f2, how are you stopping the rook invading? King here, knight g6, check. And if king here, well, we're still going here. White is going to get at the pawn one way or the other, by way of g8 or f7. So, no rook takes pawn. The bishop plays into d7 to help defend against this uh, rook invasion, preparing to play bishop to e8. Stopping a rook move to the 7th, and also even a knight jump into g6. So white inserts a check. If the king moves, the rook is going to get out the pawn like this. So the bishop blocks. He uh, is much uh, worse off on the c8 square than d7. So further away from controlling these squares now. Knight g2. White is giving up the c3 pawn in order to now establish a strong point, uh, a strong post on f4. Rook takes c3, knight f4. So white uh, has given back the pawn, but still has what? Still has an active king, superior minor piece, and space. Okay, I would say that in, in this position, both of the rooks are active. But uh, white is going to coordinate their rook with the strong knight, whereas black cannot do so with the bishop. Rook c1, rook a8, king d7. So there may be the temptation here to give a check and pick up the pawn, but that wouldn't work because there's a skewer that would follow. The king and, and the rook would be on the, on the g-file. So, king f3, now this is an idea. Rook c3, king f2, king g2, and if black isn't careful, there's this quick idea to transfer the rook quickly to the f-file with check, and then get into the 8th or 7th rank. So, black gets off of the open file. Rook to a1, this is a beautiful demonstration of uh, rook flexibility or a, a rook threatening to enter by way of f1 or maybe the seventh or eighth rank uh, how do you stop this the rook is completely uh, optimized from the a1 square 14 options from this corner post rook c7 i'm assuming that's preparing to meet rook f1 with rook f7 now the white king is able to advance a little bit more. There isn't this fear like there was previously of a black rook coming over to g1 to challenge the king's position. So he's stepping up, supporting uh, an eventual knight f1 move. We do have this. Rook a7, king g3, getting off of this diagonal. So there is now an idea to hunt down or put pressure 
on e6, and when you do capture it, you wouldn't be in a pin now that the king is on g3. You can also view king g3 as a bit of a waiting move. Rook e7 follows. Knight d3, where is he headed? He's very good from f4, where he exerts pressure on e6, but he's even better from c5. Why? Well, he's going to not only put pressure on the base point, but start to take away squares from all three black pieces. He is completely dominant from the c5 post. So that's what we have. The knight circling into c5. And he is without question the MVP of the game. This knight completely dominating the bishop from this point. And black at this stage plays g6, a sit and wait approach from this stage instead of this advance is no good. You know, a sit and wait approach to keep moving the king back and forth. Let me just show why that is not a good idea. White is in, white would be able to improve and eventually track down this pawn and score a touchdown. So what is tried is g6, h6 is the reply, and now one by one the knight is able to simply pick off all of the black pawns, and from here there really isn't too much more to note. The knight scoops them all up, and we're just a few moves away before black throws in the towel. Move 95, and that's the ball game right there. Rook f7, black throws in the towel, Stockfish resigns here. So if the game played out, this is how it may play out straight to checkmate, eventually promoting a pawn. Black has to give up the rook, and that's just one of many ways this game could have finished. So what more to add about this game? Stockfish, playing c4 even though it came with tempo, confronted you with an unsolvable dilemma. Have your king knight's mobility diminished, or your chosen path? Give me a pawn in order to obtain some peace mobility. I obtained a space advantage as early as move 4. Giving me a second advantage in the form of material was the beginning of the end. You should know better than to release the central tension. Every little alpha knows.